go back to this. Okay, so if we go back to this, um, there is a question just like number one on your final that you have to know how to do this stuff. Mean, uh, median mode, quartiles, interquartile range is just Q3 minus Q1. So I feel like that hopefully we're good with that. Um, I would definitely recommend on your piece of paper that you can use, whether or not you make a separate sheet of paper or you write on the formula sheet I gave you, to write the percentages down for um, a normal distribution. Because if I give you a mean and a standard deviation, and I tell you exactly how far away it is, you could use a z-score, but you also could use that if it's a perfect one, two, three standard deviations away. Um, and then we kind of talked about z-scores the other day, maybe Wednesday when I came back. Uh, and this is all posted online as well. But you definitely are going to have to find z-scores, and you're going to have to use that paper that I gave you, which I'll give you one with the final tomorrow, um, to to find the percentile. So remember if it says like what percentile are you in, that's where you look on the chart and you give the number as a percent. But if it says how many people are more, like what percent are more than that, uh, like on number seven, you would take one minus that number. So if you're in the 98th percentile, really only like one, one uh, percent, two percent of people did better than you. Uh, number eight, there was like the diff, like find the percent in between and you just subtract the two percentile scores to get that. Um, so that's the like Z score normal distribution stuff. And then the formula is like simple interest, compound interest. If they're having you use one of those, it will say simple interest or it will say compounded. I think a good example of that is, um, like number number 11, um, I think it's easy to want to use the savings plan formula on number 11, but it asks if you're going to deposit a lump sum that's compounded monthly. So if it's talking about depositing money only one time, that's just compound interest. Um, but if they're talking about depositing money every month um, or making a payment every month, that's where you use the savings plan formula or the loan value formula that's on that formula sheet. And again, the new version of that formula sheet even gives you the one solved for, like if you're solving for the loan payment, they, they solve that equation for you, or if you're solving for the total value. Um, as we've been working in here, right, it's important that you're practicing typing that in your calculator um, because I won't help you during the test tomorrow if you say, it says overflow error, or I know this isn't the right answer, I'm gonna say try it again. And so either you gotta make sure you know those parentheses or, thank you Jordan, you can do like the work here. Like you can just type the top of that fraction and type that decimal down. Do the bottom of the fraction. And if you do it a step at a time, if, if the parenthesis part stresses you out, then you can just show that work and then type it in. And then you don't have to get overwhelmed with uh, the thing. The other big part to, to recognize is they ask a lot about like, how much are you putting in versus how much interest are you getting? And so when they ask how much you are putting in, if you put in $300 a month for 43 years, $300 for 12 months for 43 years, like that's how much money you're putting in out of your own pocket. But when there's interest there, and this question was crazy because it was like a nine and a half percent interest rate. Um, on this one, like over $2 million of that money came from interest, which is absurd, which I don't know, unless you just like hit the stock market really good. I don't know that you would get a nine and a half percent interest rate, but that's how you can find the diff. Like how much did you put in versus how much interest is there? And I know there's a question, like there's questions kind of like in that same order with both savings amounts and loan amounts, okay? So I'm gonna scroll through these. I feel like we were talking about these, but make sure you look at them. If you are getting a mortgage or you're borrowing money to buy a car, a credit card, anytime that you're paying money back, you're gonna use the loan formula that they gave you. Um, I will say number 16, we didn't ever really do stuff like number 16. The formula's on the paper, but I will tell you that on your test, um, if I give you a question like number 16, it'll be like on the extra credit part, on the challenge part. Um, just because we didn't use that formula, it's very interesting to look at. And I think next year if I teach this class, I probably will use this formula because it talks about if you're just making the minimum payment to a, a credit card company, um, how much money you can save depending on um, whether you, like if the minimum payment is $143, how long will it take you to pay off that credit card? With, with an 18 
6.99% interest, which is a very common credit card percent rate. And you would have to spend, like you get 180 when you solve that, which is in months, divide by 12, which means it would take you 15 years if you never added any more to your credit card and you sent the minimum payment. And it shows that you paid over $17,000 in interest because you only owed 8,500, but you ended up paying over $25,000. And if you think back when we did that with mortgages, you might borrow $100,000 for a mortgage, but if you have a 30 year loan at a 7% interest rate, you end up paying like more in interest than the house cost. And so that's kind of just like to show you this. And so they, this question said, if you sent $200 a month instead of 143, how much time and money could you save? Uh, so same formula, all I did was change the 143 to 200 uh, and you get 71 months divided by 12, which is six years. So instead of 15 years, if you just spent, if you just sent 57 more dollars a month, you, uh, you would cut what, seven years off of that? No, nine years, 15 minus six is nine. Um, and you would only pay, um, or you would save $11,340. It's kind of crazy, right? And so kind of the lesson of that is send extra money if you can. But anyway, 16, which has parts A, B, C, D, and E. If there's a question like that on your test, it's going to be extra credit, okay? Uh, after 16, that's where we get into that we're finally out of the money stuff. We talked about ratios, we talked about percents. Um, and so 17 asked to like write it as a ratio. If you're writing that as a fraction, you have to like reduce the fraction. So six chaperones for 80 students, you could reduce that to three over 40. So like there are three chaperones for 40 students, or you can write it like three to 40, three colon 40. Number 18 is a proportion. I thought 18 was a little tricky because they tell you that for every three games they win, they lose two games. And if they played 40 games total, how many did they win? So you have to kind of think a little bit. If they won three and they lost two, that's like for every five games. That's the total. So in your proportion, remember to just line up the units. So I said for every three games, they played five total games. How many games did they play uh, or win if they played 40 total? Same thing for the one on here. Isn't there one about maybe not? But like, I feel like we had one before of like, if it takes two cups of sugar to do this, how many cups of sugar would it take to do whatever? Like that's a proportion problem. Like just line up the units. I thought this one was a little bit trickier to do that. Uh, number 19, this is not my work, if you can tell. Um, number 19, I, they set up a little proportion for each one to do this. This is what I did on number 19, just the percent discount. So it said you wanna buy a suit for $250 and <clears throat> there's a 25% off sale. So what I did is I said, well, if it's 25% off, that means I'm paying 75%. I could have also said that's like saying one minus 0.25, like that's what you would be paying. And so I said, okay, if I have 25% off, I'm paying 75%. So that would mean I owe 187.50. And then you had an additional 15% off. So I took 187.50 times 1 minus 15%, which is 85%, right? If I have 15% off, I'm paying 85%. And so I paid a whole total of 159.37. Someone in my fifth hour said they got 159.38 because maybe I rounded wrong. Um, but the big thing is if you have a discount and a discount, remember you can't add those together. If you have a 50% off coupon and then an additional 50% off coupon, that's not 100% off. You have to take the 50% first, take that amount, and then take 50% of that. Um, and so definitely, I, I know there's a question on the test where you have to do like a discount like that. And so um, they just did the like percent over 100 part over the whole. So like that's what they did here. But I don't know. I felt like that was way more complicated than how I did that problem. But, okay. Um, number 20 talked about relative change. It says, which has the biggest percent change? Relative change is when we do, and I don't know that this is on your formula sheet. Um, remember that relative change is like new minus old over old. Relative change. We did that so many times in first semester with different things. So if they talk to you, I think this one was like, <laughs> this was terrible. It was about like 
deaths, murders, um, homicide rate, but it compared Terre Haute with, I don't even know what we were comparing it to, but, um, and so in Terre Haute, there were 24 and then there were 30. So if you do 30 minus 24 over 20, they went ahead and like said times 100. I just did this and then I got 0.25 and then I multiplied by 100 to say that was a 25% increase. And then Gary had um, 67 and then they had 73. Uh, so if we're talking about the relative change, then when we do this, you get they only had an 8.96%. So if we're talking about which one had the biggest relative change, we would say Terre Haute had the biggest one. <coughs> okay, questions about that? Remember doing that? Maybe make sure you write that. If it's not, I don't know if that's on the formula sheet. Anybody know? I don't think it's on there. Relative change. This one is like, which is the better deal? Um, and so they give you like how much a jar of peanut butter costs, how many ounces it is. So like that's where you do like the price per ounce. Um, and so I just took the price divided by ounces. So that's price per ounce. If I'm doing price per ounce, I want the cheapest one, which would be 14 cents per ounce. Uh, yesterday, someone in my fifth hour said they did it the opposite way. They divided, they did ounce per dollar. And if you did that, you would want the most ounces for $1. Which, so then they just picked the bigger answer. So, I, so they asked me if that was okay. And I was like, as long as you understand what you're processing, like that you would pick the bigger number in that sense, because you want the most ounces for $1. Um, but to me, price per ounce makes the most sense. Um, if they give you a question like this on the final, like make sure you show some work of like, don't, if they say, which is a better deal? Don't just say this one. Like you have to either show work or explain why you know that that's the answer, okay? Then we have probability, and I'll tell you that uh, I am cheating a little bit and using this final that, well, I added stuff to it and subtracted stuff from it, but the final is about cards, but really nice on the final. If it said, what's the chance of drawing a face card? In parentheses, it would say, face cards are jack, queen, king. Uh, if it says, find the chance of getting a club, it'll say, there are 13 clubs, right? Like it tells you, but if you don't know there are 52 cards in the deck, Maybe you need to write that on your piece of paper. Um, if, if you don't know that there are, well, no, it says the 13. I feel like that's all you need to know. Or there are four aces, there are four jacks, there are four of each one. Those are things they don't say, but they do tell you, like, there are 13 clubs, or a face card is this, and so hopefully that will help. I think even on this formula sheet, they give you formulas for, like, when to add versus when to multiply. But remember with probability, you can write it as a fraction, a percent, or a decimal. Um, but if they say, what's the chance of getting this or this, you add those probabilities. But if it could happen at the same time, you have to subtract out the chance of it happening at the same time. So what's the chance of getting an ace or a queen? Well, there are four out of 52 aces. There are four out of 52 queens. And notice they said minus zero out of 52, because no card can be both an ace and a queen. But look underneath here, a face card or a club, face cards are jacks, queens, kings. So there's four of each one of those, and they're, so for a 12 out of 52, there are 13 out of 52 clubs. But you have to subtract out the jack, queen, king of clubs, because that would be counted in both. That's what we call the overlapping probabilities. And so um, some people just say, well, I'll only count 10 out of 52, and that's fine. You've just done the subtraction in your head. But just don't forget that you have to think about, could it happen at the same time? Remember, if it's and, and they might not always say the word and, it might just say, what's the chance of drawing three clubs? So you have to think about, well, that's a club and a club and a club. And is when you multiply those. Um, and so or means add, and means multiply. And the other thing I want to say about that is, remember, we did the like at least. I don't know if that formula is on your paper either. But remember, if you have the probability the probability of getting at least something, you do however many times, you do one minus the probability of it happening to the n, which is how many times. So like number 27 says, what's the probability of getting at least one club? Well, if you don't do it this way, you have to do the chance of getting one club or the chance of getting two clubs or the chance of getting three clubs, which is kind of more complicated. 
Or you can just take one minus the probability of not getting a club and take that to the third power. And so um, I would recommend maybe writing that example or making sure you have that formula down to do that. And so this one is if you, this was with replacement, this was without replacement. So notice on this one, uh, if you don't replace it, it really does change the value. I'll tell you, if I'm going to give you one, we didn't really do any like this, right? So if I give you one, it's going to follow that formula that we did. So you kind of don't have to worry about 28. Okay? Okay, I don't feel like that many of you have looked at this multiple choice. But I did put some multiple choice on the test. And so I'm going to suggest maybe that you go look at this at some point. But I want to... Um, go through and talk about some important ones that maybe you should star. So, hint, hint. <laughs> mm, that was just a ratio. Let's see here. Um, that was another relative change. I gotta think about which ones I should be talking about here. Oh, this one. I think you should look at question four. Because it kind of talks about which would be a better um, value. And so it says, should he take $1,000 at the end of the year? or one and a half percent of his current salary and so you just have to compare those options uh so in this case well if i add a thousand to sixty thousand i know that's sixty one thousand so i did well what would be sixty thousand times 1.5 percent if i change that to a decimal well that's only nine hundred dollar raise and so in in this case if he took the one and a half percent raise that's not as much as getting the thousand dollar raise so in this case he should add a thousand dollars to the salary there is a question just like this on your test, but they're different numbers, but just kind of comparing the options, which one is better to do. I don't think that was so bad, right? Um, this one I feel like goes right with what we did uh, on the other ones, only it's way easier than the ones you have to compute yourself. Because on this one, they tell you that Patricia borrowed so much money. Uh, they offered her interest, they gave all this stuff, but then they told us, they used Excel, and they know that they're gonna pay um, that they're gonna pay a monthly payment of four nineteen oh five. So you don't have to use a savings account formula, but it says how much will she be paying in interest? So that's where you have to figure out how much is she paying all together. So you have to take her monthly payment times monthly times fifteen years. So she's paying over seventy five thousand dollars. Notice that's one of the answers. That's not how much interest she's paying because she borrowed sixty one thousand. So then you have to subtract that to get the answer. So just be careful. Sometimes I think multiple choice, uh, it's easy to pick an answer that's an in-between step than what you're doing, but practice that on the other part. So hopefully that one won't be so bad. And again, this is posted as well, if I'm going too fast. Um, oh, this is a good percent problem, right? About dollar general stores, which are everywhere. Um, I would like to see what the percent is now about Dollar General stores. Uh, this one, they give us the amount of Dollar General stores in 2020, and they say that that was up 30% from the number of stores in 2016. Uh, it says use this information to calculate the number of Dollar stores in 2016, but then the question is how many Dollar stores were added? And so the first thing I had to think of, and this one I had to kind of think about what I was trying to do. Um, I know that 17,266 is the new number. That's 30% more than there were to begin with. So I kind of use like, I don't know if you want to think about this one, or like the new amount equals the original amount times one plus R. If it was decreasing, it would be one minus R. And so that's kind of where I got this equation of like, I know there's 17,266. I know the rate of increase was 30% and I'm solving for that original amount. And so I just divided that over and I got that there originally, I rounded up, were 13,282 stores. So how many were added? I just subtracted those two to get that answer. So again, kind of just another percent problem, but kind of a different way than the like price of the suit. Oh my God. Turn off the oh look, we're definitely not doing this question. You see all my scribbles. I thought this was a really like I don't know why I thought this was so hard. You don't have to write this one down. But um, 
they wanted you to compare those two statements, but it's so tricky with one, one, um, like Lori earns 82% of what Steve earns, which is a true statement, which made me think this was also a true statement, but it's not because if you put Steve first, it's not the same. But anyway, you don't have to do that one. I was very mad about that one. Um, you don't have to do that. So there you go. Number 10, mark number 10. This is another, I think, percent ratio kind of problem. They give you an employee breakdown with a chart, uh, but the question says, if there are 36 salaried management in this company, how many total employees are there? So if you look up on this one, the salaried, salaried production is, oh look, I think I totally did this wrong. Does that say 36 or, oh no, salaried production, salaried management, okay, I did it right. Salary management is 12%. So basically, I'm trying to figure out if 36 of those people represent 12% of the company, like 36 is 12% of what number? So to me, I kind of think of that. Uh, and if you want to write this equation, if you do percent over 100 equals the part compared to the whole amount. So in this case, 36 is the part and I'm looking for the whole amount, so that's my 36 over X, and you can set that equal to 12 over 100, and then you can solve for that missing part. There's definitely other ways of setting it up, but that's kind of how I think about it, and when we talked about percents, we kind of talked about that part over the whole, um, and so in this case, there's 300. You also could work backwards with multiple choice. You could, you could just take 12% uh, of each of these numbers and say which one gives you 36, right? That would also be work um, based since it's multiple choice. So hopefully like you wouldn't say 30 because there can't be 30 employees if 36 is 12%. So that kind of goes goes with that too. But I like that one. How many is that that we talked about? Four? <laughs> okay, actually I think I'm going to talk about two more. I'm ready to go. All right, number 11. Two more and I'm done, I promise. Number 11 says paint samples are often sold um, by the pint. A pint will cover 50 square feet. If the dimensions of the room are 87 inches by 96 inches, how many pints of paint would you need to paint the ceiling of this room? So that just means you need like length times width, the area. So first thing I did is I did the area, 87 inches by 96 inches, which would give me um, over 8,000 square inches. But this is kind of a conversion thing, right? This is in square inches, and the paint is sold by in square feet of how much it covers. And so you have to think about, right, that I said 50 square feet, there are 12 inches in one foot. But when we're talking about area, we don't convert by just saying 12 inches in one foot. You have to think it's 12 by 12. So you would say there are 144 square inches in one square foot. So then your units would cancel. Or you could do inches to feet. I just did this. So I got that that one pint of paint would actually cover 7,200 square inches. So I just took how many I needed, divided by how much it would cover, and I got 1.16 pints, which means I can't buy 1.16 of a pint, so I have to buy two pints of paint, and I should have a lot left over. But if you're converting with square units, you gotta be careful, okay? So there are 144 square inches in one square foot. I don't think this is on there, but just reminding you, like, if you have to do some kind of conversion, like lining those units up, that's, I feel like that's where we started in this chapter, or in this class back in August, is like unit conversion. Um, it looks like I wouldn't put this question on here, but I just read this one wrong. But uh, last one, per capita. We talked about per capita. Per capita means per person. And because this is multiple choice, you have to look at the answers and see what makes the most sense. If you do this, there are 73,712 full-time police officers in California, and the population is 39.5 million. If I want to find how many are there 
per person, I would just divide those two numbers. But when you divide those two numbers, you get 0 0.0018. And that would be, there are 0 0.0018 police officers per one person. But it kind of doesn't make sense to say that because we don't need one police officer for every one person. So remember, they often do it like per 1,000 or per 10,000 or per million. And that's where, uh, when I, I said, I looked at the answers here and I said, well, definitely the first two made no sense to me. But when I took my answer and I multiplied by 10,000, I got 18.66 police officers per 10,000 people. So look, I very quickly circled this third answer. But look at what it says. It says there are approximately 19 full-time police officers in every 10,000 people. So it doesn't mean in every 10,000 people. And that's why this kind of annoyed me because it's just the wording. It's like per 10,000 people. It doesn't mean for every 10,000 people, there's exactly 19 police officers, which is why that isn't the best answer. But the next answer is the best answer because if I say per every million, I can take that number times a million and it says there are approximately 186 full-time police officers per every million. So like the key, the key phrase there, there is it has to be like per the number, but then you just got to figure out what you're multiplying it by to do it. And so um, I hope you could cross out, like I crossed out these one, two, three right away, but um, it's not in per capita per every so many, okay? Well, but if the two of them have per in it, like look at that one, that has per in it too. So you have to also look at the numbers that make sense to go with it. But uh, that was a little tricky, okay? I think that that's um, all we need to talk about. The rest of these are, they're all there, but um, I just want to make sure we talk about them. Yes. Okay.